Well, good evening everyone. I was watching the clock there because I'm almost in danger of starting early tonight, which is a bit <laughs> unheard of, so I was kind of delaying a wee bit just so that we would uh, not start before uh, folk had had a chance to get in. Welcome to everyone who's out with us this evening. We're delighted to see you in that wet old night. Um, welcome to those on Zoom as well. It's good to have you here this evening. Now we're going to start by singing. Um, so I think the words of the hymn are hopefully going to come up on the screen, and there they are. So when my life work has ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and his smile will be the first to welcome me. So it's not something else to think about what it's going to be like when we meet the Lord Jesus. Uh, what a great way to start our service this evening, uh, thinking on that. So thank you, Hannah.
So that was a great way to open our service. I have to confess it's a year or two since I have uh, sung that one and took a wee while to get the tune in my head. But the words are fantastic, aren't they? To think that we're going to know the Lord Jesus. We know the Lord in one sense uh, and in a very real way now, but in heaven we're going to see him face to face and see those nail-scarred hands. Scarred, of course, for us, that we might be forgiven. So, I've welcomed you, and I welcome anybody else who's come in to our service this evening. I'm going to read some verses from the Word of God. If you want to look those out, Revelation chapter 7, and we're going to read uh, from verse 9. Now, the, ver the, wor the verses here will be on the screen, so you'll be able to follow along there as well. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. And we were thinking this morning, and we've been thinking over the last few days, about the death of the Queen. And uh, we, we spent a minute contemplating that this morning. Um, and we're reminded that we have a great King in heaven, the Lord Jesus. We were reading, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And so our kings and queens, of course, um, as we've been reminded, are temporary and they do die. But our King, the Lord Jesus, his throne is eternal, and He reigns forever. So let's pray as we uh, start our meeting this evening and give praise to our God. Heavenly Father, as we meet together this evening in this place, we are reminded that You are the great King, that your throne is in heaven, and that it never changes, never fails, and that through you we have salvation, that salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are that precious Lamb who was slain, who died on the cross to take away our sins, that we might be forgiven. We thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us, how you planned, Lord, and how you became a man, lived, and died not because of anything good in us, Lord, and that you died for us while we were still sinners. Such great love, Lord, for us, and we want to thank you and praise you for that. And as we've been singing this evening, Lord, it's because of what you have done that one day we will see you, we will know you, and be able to praise you as we ought to, Lord. 
And so, Lord, we do ask this evening that you would accept the praises of our hearts, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, to focus our minds on you, to let other distractions and concerns fall away, and to concentrate on what you have to say. Father, we pray that you'd be with each one who's taking part. We thank you for Andrew, who's come to share your word with us this evening. We ask, Lord, that you would bless him, help him, and enable him, Lord, as he shares what you've laid on his heart. Father, at this time, we do want to remember um, those in our congregation, Lord, who are perhaps laid up with illness, Lord. We want to pray for Johnny, Lord, and we thank you for bringing him home safely, Lord. Father, we pray that he would be able to get uh, sorted out with his surgery soon, Lord, and uh, uh, Lord, on the road to recovery. We pray you be with Catherine and uh, Rebecca and Bethany at this time as well, Lord, and help them. Father, we thank you, Lord, for um, our Queen, Lord. At this time, we want to remember her family and pray that you would help them, Lord, through this time of mourning. And for the many others around our nation, Lord, who will be sad and mourning at this time as well, we even ask, Lord, that you would use this time, Lord, to speak to men and women, boys and girls, to remind them of the importance of considering their eternal destiny, Lord, that they might even turn to you, Lord, be brought into your family, Lord. Father, we commit this time to you. We ask, Lord, that you be with us, that you would bless us, and that, Father, you would speak to us. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to uh, just run through the announcements now. So if you manage to get an announcement sheet, um, I'll have a wee look at those now. I do want to thank Andrew Mullen, who's with us this evening. Um, and uh, I hadn't met Andrew before, and uh, uh, Andrew tells me he's uh, been previously working with Morn Presbyterian and is now uh, doing a PhD. And maybe, Andrew, you'll say a wee bit about that when you're up here, what you're up to. <laughs> so uh, we're really glad to have Andrew with us, and you say hello to Andrew at the end of the service and find out a bit more about him. We have communion at the end of the service. If you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, please stay with us and share in communion together. Now, for the rest of the week here, um, just to share the announcements then, um, the Mums and Tots uh, group uh, are going to be here tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. cleaning up the toys. Starts of, start of Mum and Tots, Mums and Tots this week. And so, um, I haven't been told this, but I'm sure they'd appreciate help if anybody's free at 10 a.m. on Monday morning. We meet here with the Bible study on Monday night, and uh, it's been a few weeks since we met. August was a busy month, and so we're back tomorrow night studying the book of James. So, it's the start of a new year, isn't it, kind of? So, if you before hadn't managed to get to our small group Bible study. This is a great time to come along and join with us. And uh, don't worry, we're reading in the book of James. We're really just getting started. And I would encourage you to come and join us if you can. So that's tomorrow evening at 8 p.m. Mums and Tots then is on Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Uh, on Wednesday evening, uh, we have the prayer meeting, Bible study and prayer time on Wednesday evening. And of course, I'd encourage you to meet with us then. On Thursday morning, we have our prayer time as well at 10 o'clock. And again, we, you'd be encouraged to join uh, with us on Thursday morning. Friday evening is junior and senior Pathfinders starting up. So, uh, Pathfinders was meant to start last week, but because of the Queen's death, we actually didn't meet on Friday night. So this is the start 
of Pathfinders. So uh, please be in prayer for that um, as we get started and we look to reach boys and girls uh, with the good news of the gospel. Sunday morning, um, we have a Sunday school at 10.15, and uh, I know they got on well this morning. Uh, next Sunday morning, we have Peter Blair, uh, Reverend Peter Blair, uh, at 11.30. Uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from Peter, and I'm sure you are too. And uh, next Sunday evening, we have Reverend Tom Glanders from Abbott's Cross Congregation on again. I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, from him. Um, I want to uh, take this chance to welcome a couple of people. Okay, it's great to have Andrew, and I've welcomed him already. Johnny, you know, everybody knows Johnny's back now. We're glad Johnny's here to get sorted. So, Johnny, you're welcome as well. Also, I uh, see uh, Johnny, uh, well, I did see him a second. Oh, there he is. <laughs> He's leaving as I welcome him. So, there's Johnny Martin and his wife, Laura, are here, uh, along with two children girls. All right, so you catch up with Johnny at the end. It's great to see him and his wife. Lovely to have them here. You catch up at the end, find out what's been happening in their lives. And I see John and Irene with us as well. It's great to have you with us tonight, John and Irene. Really fantastic. We're glad you're here. Um, just with regard to the rest of the announcements then, if you feel you need a, a, a visit from a minister, please speak to us. Uh, we do need helpers for crash. There's joy. You catch up with joy. Uh, the next time out, ladies' Bible studies for the 22nd of September. Strayed Youths back on the 23rd of September, and our members' meeting is on the 11th of October. So I think, I think that's all I need to share. With oh, here's another. Yes, thank you, Hannah. Oh yes, okay. We did mention this, I think, last week. Um, our, Hannah is our chief craft person in Senior Pathfinders, and our craft this year, we need lots of old magazines, okay? So, if you've got any old magazines lying around the house, give them to Hannah, and she'll make sure we make good use of them um, in church. So, please remember that as well if you can. We're going to sing again now, and as we sing, I'm going to hand over to Andrew, who's going to bring the message for us this evening.
Good evening. It's really good to be with you tonight in Straight Congregational. I can't confess, I've never been to Straight before, but I can't say that again. It's great to be with you. I know I've missed out. Um, it's so good. Thank you for the invitation. I'm not sure what the connection was, um, but it's really good to be here because we're here to open up God's Word together and think about it. Uh, John, thank you for your welcome. You asked me to say a wee bit about my studies. All I can tell you is that they're really boring. Um, <laughs> And if you're struggling to sleep, let me know, and I'll give you a copy of a chapter and you can read it for me. Uh, Joking aside, I'm studying the preaching of a a man called James Usher, who was primate, the archbishop in the 1640s in Ireland and uh, in England. Uh, I'm really studying his preaching. I'm a Presbyterian. He's the Church of Ireland. I'm in a congregational tonight. I don't know where I am sometimes, um, but I'm really studying his preaching at a very interesting time in history, and I'm studying that with a view to hopefully, by the grace of God, maybe getting an opportunity to do some teaching overseas, um, maybe in a theological college or amongst um, young evangelists, but we'll see what the Lord has in store and by his grace and mercy. But what we're going to do is we're going to pray. Um, but maybe before we do that, let me read from Isaiah. This is the passage I'm going to preach on tonight. If you have your Bible, can I encourage you to open it up there? And it's Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, what I was going to preach on changed during the week, and that'll become apparent, but we're going to read together God's Word. And it's Isaiah chapter 6, and let's read the whole chapter. This is God's word. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the fountains are the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing but do not understand. Keep on seeing but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste, and the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land, and though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. Amen. I'm finishing there at the end of verse 13. Let's join together again in prayer and allow me to lead us as we pray. Father, our Father, we thank you for all your goodness and your grace to us. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us not just this day, but you've given us morning and evening of this day. And we thank you that we now meet together and this place of public worship. Our Father, we thank you for your grace to us in giving us a Bible that we might hear from you, that we might read your word and know that you're speaking to us. Father, we know that you speak to us most clearly through your word. It is your testimony that you would leave with us for all generations and all time. It's unchanging and yet it's relevant and it's up to date right today. Father, there's much that we want to bring before you. We want to bring our lives before you, first of all. And Father, I want to thank you for bringing all these people into this meeting tonight. I thank you for those that are old, and I thank you for those children that are running about. We love to see every one of them here. I thank you for those that are regulars week by week and those that are visitors. But Father, we thank you that you've brought us here. 
We ask, Lord, that you would speak to us about where we stand with you so that we might not just know a few things about you, but we might know your son, Jesus, that we might trust in him and that we might live our lives for him. Father, I pray that you would speak to each person that's gathered in tonight. Lord, many will know you and have been Christians for many years. And so I pray you would strengthen them. But for those that do not know you who are unsaved, I pray that they would get right with you this night. Lord, that they would get right with you quickly before we step into eternity, and we have no idea when that's going to be. Father, I, I don't know straight congregational, but I want to pray for this congregation. I want to ask, Father, that you would lead them and guide them and bless them. It was great to hear those announcements of much happening and, and young people being encouraged and toddlers and Bible studies. And Father, I ask that you would bless I ask, Father, that you'd build up this church numerically as more join it. And, Father, in depth as those that know you grow in righteousness and love and holiness. Father, I, I don't know whether they're, they're looking for a, a pastor or a minister or where they're at in that journey. But I pray that, Lord, you would lead and guide and direct. And, Father, for our nation as well, we thank you that you are a God who hears all our prayers, not just small about ourselves, but you're working in this world. At any one second, you're doing a hundred million things, and we can maybe only ascertain one or two. And Father, we would pray in our nation at this time of great sadness, Lord, of uncertainty, that you would give us two things, that we would look back to our queen of blessed memory, and that we would give you thanks for many good things. We thank you, Father, for the testimony of her saving faith in you that we heard particularly snippets of at Christmas. We thank you for those who have testified in Parliament that this was a lady who knew you. And to be absent from this scene of time means to be present with you. And so, Father, we thank you for that. Lord, we pray for our country, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. We pray for the commonwealths and territories that our queen, Queen Elizabeth, was monarch over. Father, we ask that in this time of bereavement that we would remember what it says in Ecclesiastes, that a sermon preaches very loudly at a funeral. And so, Father, we ask that you would speak about eternity and about the need to get right with you, that that would be loud and resounding throughout our nation. Father, we pray as well for our new king, King Charles III. Father, we ask that that he would follow you and know you as his king, that though he is the monarch that you have appointed, as Daniel said, you're the one that raises up kings and you're the one that sets them down. And so we ask that our king would be a king that humbles himself before you, the one true and living king. Father, we ask that you would give him a long reign. We ask, Father, that you would bring him much blessedness and happiness as we sing in our national anthem. And yet, Father, that would be a, a, a reign that exalts righteousness and seeks to honor you. Father, we pray for the good government in our land. As our king is ceremonial, we pray for Liz Truss, our prime minister, and the new cabinet and government. Father, we pray that you would give them great wisdom and that they would be those that seek to honor you, that they would be seeking to, be, to, to run a government that pleases you, Father, we're so conscious that as we read our Bible, as the leaders, so the people. And so we would ask for good government in our land. Father, we come before you as children to a father. Lord, I ask that you would bring us to your word tonight and that it would speak to us and help us that we might say it's good for us to be here. We thank you, Father, that you want to pour out so much blessing on us. So, Father, let it be good for us to be here tonight. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the death of the longest reigning monarch, the death of the longest reigning monarch in the United Kingdom is a phrase that we've heard many times over the last number of days. And what did our queen embody? Stability, constancy, consistency. Maybe you can relate to an unsettled or disoriented perspective. I've heard it said in the news a number of times, such a sadness that our longest reigning monarch could not reign forever. The death of a monarch, such as Her Majesty, who was a visible link to our nation's golden past. Her Majesty the Queen wore uniform, military uniform during the Second World War. Her Majesty the Queen is a visible link to maybe your parents or your grandparents 
you will be at least an octogenarian if you can remember another monarch before Her Majesty. My brother informed me today that there are two people in the United Kingdom who have lived through six monarchs, going back to Edward VII. When the queen came to the throne, mankind hadn't climbed the highest mountain on this planet. When Her Majesty left the throne, mankind had sent a spacecraft to Mars. Her Majesty embraced change. Change is constant, she said, but managing it is an expanding discipline. But the gnawing fear, the gnawing fear is that the death of a monarch is linked to the decline of a nation. When we read our Bible so often, what do we read? When we go through the Old Testament, as the leaders, so the people. I mean, why did God take his, his people into exile and in Assyria or Babylon, because the people deserted him, as the kings deserted him, and the priests deserted him, so the people followed, and God judged them for that. But we're in the book of Isaiah tonight, Isaiah chapter 6, and how does Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 begin? We can maybe read this chapter in a way we've never looked at it before, and this is one of the most familiar chapters in the Bible, but how does Isaiah begin this chapter? He begins this chapter in a way he didn't begin the first five chapters. In fact, he does something at the start of this chapter he didn't do previously. He begins it, and you know the words, in the year that King Uzziah died. In Isaiah chapter 1, he tells us about Uzziah and Jotham and Hezekiah. He tells us about in the year of these kings. He tells us about their reigns. And he started off chapter 1, and he told us that the kings are reigning, and he's now bringing the word of God. But now he's got to chapter 6, and he's not talking about the reign of a king. He's talking about the death of a king. And why this sudden, now this is an important question for us, why this sudden change of perspective? What does Isaiah take back? And it's really important that we come. It's really important that we publicly gather together. And it's so often we think about, what is the Lord saying to me? I mean, justification is, I am right with God. What is God doing in my life? And that's important. That's really important. Do you know God? Are you saved? Are you born again? But there are times in the Bible where it's not just on a personal level it speaks to us. But it actually asks us to step back and think about something that's happening not even on a local level or a church level, but a national level. And we need to think about that. Because God's speaking to us on a national level right in these days. Because Isaiah takes a step back, and he has the perspective of the death of their longest reigning monarch. Because Uzziah came to the throne as a 16-year-old. Nobody had reigned as long as Uzziah. He reigned for 52 years. And his death in 740 BC was significant. Uzziah, Uzziah was a, a monarch who was a link to a golden age, a previous golden age. Uzziah started off his reign, and it was said of Uzziah, Uzziah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Uzziah was a man that embraced change. Uzziah was a, was a king who was in the forefront of technology and change. Uzziah was one that served in the military. Uzziah was a leader that people looked up to. And when they thought about Uzziah, they thought, the good old days of our nation. Maybe you're like that. Maybe you watch things in black and night and you say, ah, oh, the way things were in the 50s. When the churches were full in the 60s, I was in a, I have a bit of time and you have no clock that I can see in this church, so you're beat tonight. But anyway, I was preaching in Armoy Presbyterian Church a few weeks ago. Never been in a Presbyterian church that had this before. But they had a wee book. And they had a wee book in the minister's room. And that wee book recorded every service that had been in that church. And it recorded who preached at it. And you had to sign it. And it recorded the number of people there. I thought it was a wee bit like the Church of Ireland. I'd never seen that in Presbyterian Church. And whenever I looked through that wee book in our Moy Presbyterian where the road races were, it showed you it started off in the 1950s. In the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, they were getting about 130, 140 people coming to that church. Then up to the 90s, you were still getting a good number, maybe about 120, 110. Then you got into the 2000s, and it dipped below 100. Well, there I was preaching, and there was 28 in the congregation. And maybe you can think back 70 years. 
Maybe you can think about when our queen came to the throne in 52 and what things were like in our country and what things were like in our church then. And we're going back to a golden age. Well, here we have the death of a king and this king related back to a golden age. This is a king who started off so well, but he finished so badly. Uzziah started off so well and he loved the Lord and he sought to follow the Lord, but then he got proud. And he went into the temple and instead of letting the priests carry out their duty, he said, I'm going to offer the incense before the Lord. I'm going to go into the temple and I'm going to take the priest's job and I'm going to offer up incense. And 80 priests came before Uzziah and you said, you do not go into the temple. You do not burn incense. And he said, no, I'm going to do it. I'm going to burn the incense. And he's having this to and fro with the priests in the temple and the Lord struck him and the Lord touched him and there was leprosy from that moment. He wasn't seen in public. He was reserved back in a palace. And so the death of King Uzziah It speaks to a nation. The death of this monarch speaks to a nation because as a king had pride in his heart, this is a nation that was proud. As the king declined and walked away from God, this is a nation, a nation of Judah that had declined and walked away from God. And now the king is dead. And Isaiah takes that perspective. This is not a happy time. This is a bleak and discouraging time. Because here's a question for you. What does Isaiah see? What does Isaiah see? How does this chapter begin? And what's Isaiah looking at? He's looking at an empty throne. Because there's no king on the throne. The king's dead. The monarch's no longer there. And Isaiah's given a message. If you were to ask me, what's the title for this message tonight? What am I supposed to remember when I go out the door? I'll give you the title. If you can remember this line, we're going places. Tonight in Isaiah chapter 6, I think I'm getting the perspective to understand it like I've never understood it before. This is God's message to a grieving nation. What's God's message tonight at Kingdom? What's God's message in 2022 to our wee country? What's God's message to you? What does he want to say to you? What does he want to say to you? What does he want to say to your family? What does he want to say to the people here in Strayed? What does he want to say to this church? Does God say nothing new? Is he not up to date? Does he nothing to say in September 11th, 2022? Has he ran out of things that are up to date? No, God has a message. God has a message that he wants to bring us. God has a message for our country and for our land. And he wants to tell us four things. God wants to tell us four things that we dare not forget. Things that we've heard before, but things that we need reminded of. Isaiah is looking at an empty throne. And he has this vision. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne. Notice that. High and exalted and the train of his robe filled the temple. Just think about some of these words with me for a moment. The word that's used there for Lord is the word Adonai, which means sovereign one. It means ruler. It means monarch. Isaiah, Isaiah sees an empty throne because the king is not there. It's a bleak and discouraging time in the nation. But instead of looking down, his eyes go up and he sees that God God is on the throne. He is a sovereign ruler over all things. Nothing has caught him off guard. In Daniel chapter 2 verse 20, it says that God raises up rulers and God sets down rulers. And this is the vision that Isaiah has. Because God is on the throne. Adonai, the sovereign one, nothing surprises him. Nothing catches him off guard. So often when I read this chapter, I thought to myself, this is set in the temple. And there is that altar in the temple. There is that, he goes to the altar and lifts a coal. But where do you find a throne? Do you find a throne in the temple in the Old Testament? No, you find a throne in a palace. And here we have a throne. And we're told that there's one on the throne. And what's he doing? Well, he's high and he's exalted. And then it says, and the train of his robe, the, probably the most famous w- wedding in the United Kingdom, this is going back a long time before I can remember, was the wedding of Charles and Diana. Many of you watched it. I know by the color of your hair you watched it. Do you remember the wedding of Charles and Diana? Do you remember Diana walked into the church and there's that long train of her robe? 
people went, wow, I mean, that's a princess to have a train in her wedding that long. Well, here's a robe, and here's a train, and the word that's used here, filled, it's actually in a continuous, sen- a continuous sense. This is a train that just keeps going on and on and on and on. It's not just a long train. It's a never-ending train. And why are we given that description? Because we're being told about one whose glory goes on. It fills the entire space. There are no room for any competitors. There's no room for anyone else to take away from the glory of God. There's no room for anyone to stand in his presence. What's God's message to the United Kingdom today? I am a God of glory, and I will not share my glory with another. Verse 2, above him were seraphs. These are the burning ones. These are incredible angels. Our king on the death of his mother, spoke about angels, something we're not very familiar with. He said some things that were true, and he said some things that had questioned. But he said that angels, if you read Luke chapter 16, angels will carry us to heaven. We maybe don't talk that language, but read Luke chapter 16, and you'll, you'll think about it again. But here we have these burning angels, and they're before the throne. They're before God. But even these sinless angels They can't stand in the presence of God, so they cover their feet. They can't look at God, so they cover their faces. And they're flying. And they're crying out something. I thought John was going to read it at the start of the service, but he read a different passage from the book of Revelation. We know that God is glorious. That's the first thing that we need to know. Our God is a glorious God who shows off his glory. Maybe you hear this excuse in straight. I hear it all the time. People say to me, you know, like maybe you're coming to church on a Sunday morning, half 11, and you're, you're caught behind the Tour de France. You know what it's like, all those cyclists out. Maybe you are one of them cyclists, and you're thinking to yourself, if they don't get out of my way, I'm going to run them off the road here. That's what happens to me. But anyway, and people say to you, you know, I don't need to go to church. Because I can go out, and you know what, I'm out looking at the beautiful countryside, and I see the trees, and I see the flowers, and, you know, I see the, the sea and all the rest of it. And it tells me, it tells me about the glory of God. I just look at God's creation and it tells me something. Well, that's true. Creation does tell us about the glory of God, but if you want to know something clearly, you go to where it's black and white and there's nowhere you'll hear about the glory of God clearer than in his word. And God tells us, God wants us to know, God's message to our nation is, I am a God of glory. I am a God that will not let my glory be competed with by any other. But I am also a God who's holy. These angels are crying out, and you've been to church many times. You know the significance of this repetition. In Hebrew, there are no adjectives. You don't say, there's a very rich man. You don't say, that's a very beautiful woman. You just repeat the word. That man is rich, rich, or that man is gold, gold. You would speak about a woman's beauty and say, that woman is beautiful, beautiful. But to say something three times... That's really intensifying it. That's really emphasizing it. God is holy. There's many things that we can say about God. We know that God is loving. We know that God is just. We know that God is righteous. We know that God is omnipresent. We know that he's omniscient. We know many things about the character of God. But before every characteristic of God, before everything to do with God, you put holy there. Now what does holiness mean? I mean, we speak about growing as a Christian. We say you're becoming more holy. Is that what it means about with God? Well, God's holiness, God's holiness is transcendent. God's holiness separates us from him. God is sinless and he's pure. God is majestic and glorious. But God is apart from us. God is over us. God is other than us. God cannot stand sin. God is a God of light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If you were to take all of God's characteristics and you were to embrace them in just one, you would say that God is holy. And says the whole earth is full of his glory. There are two ways that you can magnify something. It's great to see some of the young people here. Maybe you're, you're doing this in, in school in biology. You know that you can magnify something in biology by getting a microscope, and you take something you put under a microscope, and it blows itself up blows itself up, but you're going to get a telescope, and that brings something that's far away and draws it near. 
And everything we see around us magnifies the glory of God. The whole earth is full of his glory. Our God is glorious and our God is holy. And what does Isaiah say here? He says, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Now I want you to think about that with me. What kind of God do we serve? What kind of God are we here to worship? Are we here to worship a genie? God, I'm in a lot of trouble and I need you to get me out of it. Do we come to a grandfather figure? God, you'll just take whatever I care to give you. Do we come to a headmaster who's always looking to tell us off? What's, what's the God that you've come to worship tonight? It's like going to your doctor and, and you go to your doctor. You don't go to somebody and say, like, I have great faith in my doctor and then tell them about your faith. You say, I have great faith in my doctor and then you tell them about the doctor. You tell them what the doctor's like. Well, what's your God like? What's his characteristics? How would you describe him? How did you prepare coming out to church tonight? Did you think to yourself, well, here, I don't know what's going to happen tonight. There's a Presbyterian going, this could all go pear-shaped. Or did you think, look, I'm coming to hear God's word. What's God going to say to me? Maybe even when we come to church, we're casual. Ah, sure, I've heard all before. We're complacent. Sure, I read the book last week. Sure, I, read, sure, I prayed last week. Sure, I was at the prayer meeting last year. Sure, I was at the prayer meeting before COVID. I prayed loads before COVID. What do I need to pray for now? Let me ask the question of the, in the nation. What kind of God is there in the United Kingdom? Who's God in Northern Ireland? What's he like? Because in Isaiah chapter 6, we meet a God who doesn't take what's casual or careless or complacent. We meet a God who's glorious and holy. What do you think of God? How are you going to come before God? I heard about a baseball player. We're not into baseball in Northern Ireland. We're not into baseball in the United Kingdom, but it's like cricket only holding the bat horizontally, isn't it? And I heard about this baseball player, and he came over to, he came over to England. His name was Babe Ruth. And he was told he was going to meet the king. I think the king at that time was either George V, George VI, or Edward VII. But he was going to come over and meet the king. And he was told all the protocol. You know the protocol for you meet the king? I met Prince Charles down in Kilkeel now, or King Charles III. And you have to go through this protocol, you know, who puts out the hand first, who said something. You're told everything you have to do. And Babe Ruth was told all the protocol as a baseball player before he'd met the king. And he walked into the king's throne room and he just went, Hey, king! Only an American could do that, right? What are you going to do to God? You think you're going to show up someday and say, Hey God, it's me. God is a God who's glorious and holy. God is a God who you should stand back with and wonder. Well, how does Isaiah respond? I reckon if I'd been in Isaiah's position, I would have went, Wow! <laughs> Look at that. God is a God of glory and God is a God of holiness. But how does Isaiah respond? What's his first word? Does he go, whoa? He doesn't go, wow. He goes, woe is me. For I am a man who's undone. I am lost. Let me ask you this question. I need you to think. How did Isaiah serve God? That's not a trick question. What was Isaiah's greatest attribute? What was he most qualified to do in a church on a Sunday morning? Play the piano? He was a preacher, wasn't he? I mean, he was God's spokesman. If you could have spoke to Isaiah, you would have said, Isaiah, look, if there's anything that you really do well, you speak God's words really well. Isaiah, your great gifting, I mean, the gift that God has given you is to be a preacher. I mean, if there's anything that you do well for God, it is to preach. But because he knows what God's like, he says, woe is me, I am lost. And then what does he say? For I am a man of unclean lips. The one thing that he did for God, the one thing that he did to serve God, was tainted by sin. And what about you? When we come before a holy and glorious God, even our very best is tainted by sin. Even our very best is tainted by that nature and that practice where we always want to rebel. And before a God who is holy and glorious, we don't just see what he's like, but we see what we're like. Sometimes I hear people talking about sin, and 
I don't need to be convicted of my sin. I don't even need you to tell me about my sin because I know it. I know it. I know I'm a sinner in thought and word and deed. And it catches me. Do you know you're a sinner in thought and in word and in deed? The things that you've done and the things that you haven't done. Your sins of commission and your sins of omission. Because the very best thing that we would come before God and we say, God, look, I'm really seeking to please you. This is what I'm doing in my life. And I'm seeking to honor you in that. Even our very best, like Isaiah here, is tainted by sin. Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. Well, how are the congregationalists doing in Northern Ireland? I can't I can answer that question, only you can. How are the Presbyterians doing? Sometimes, you know, in Presbyterian churches, we think to ourselves, you know, we're like a people set apart. You know, even in Northern Ireland, I talk to friends, I'm studying over in Scotland, and I say to myself, like, if we're 20 years behind Scotland, if the church is 20 years behind Scotland, we're in a lot of problems. And we think even here in Ulster, even here in Northern Ireland, we're still holding the line a wee bit, aren't we? We're still trying. We're not just caught up with England yet. And we think, Elik, you know, even in our church, we understand. We understand about marriage. We haven't lost the plot completely. We, we understand that marriage is between one man and one woman, right? I mean, we see the world around us and we think to ourselves, it's gone crazy. And we could say, but look, we're not there yet. We understand about abortion. It should break our heart. It should break our heart that abortion has been legalized in Northern Ireland. And we look at the world around us and we say, this cannot be. Those of you in older generation, I'm sure you're amazed. Gender reassignment. Boys who want to become girls and girls who want to become boys. And we look around it and we think, the world has gone mad. What is the world we're bringing these children up in? What's it going to be like in another generation if this is the direction of travel? And sometimes you think, well, look, at least in the church, at least in the church we haven't went there yet. But what does Isaiah say to us? He says, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. We're not as different as we think we are. We're not as set apart as we think we are. We haven't got it together as we think we are. We're not as distinctive as we should be. And Isaiah says, I see the sin in my own life, and I'm not as separated from these people as I think I am. He says, I live amongst the people. And for the first five chapters of the book of Isaiah, he's laid out really clearly the people's sin. He set it out in great detail for five chapters. And then he said, I'm one of them. I'm one of them people. God's holiness has a consequence. It shows us exactly what we're like. Sometimes we like to compare ourselves to others in the church or others in the world. At least we're not doing what they're doing. At least we're not as bad as what they're doing. But that doesn't show us what we're like. It's only when we come before God that we see what we're really like. Maybe I could speak to you as a stranger. Sometimes it's easier. Maybe I could speak to you and say, well, what's going on in your life? Some of you are going to be taking communion in a moment. This is an opportunity for to examine ourselves. Because we're coming before our God, and our God is glorious, and our God is holy. And it has, a, it has an implication from my life. I'm not going to waltz into his presence someday, and I'm not just going to go, hey, king! Because he is a great and glorious God. I told you two things, two things that need to be known in our, in our lives, in our church, in this village, this town, and in our nation. But here's the third. God is a God of grace. Are you convicted over your sin? Are you absolutely devastated about the state of your family? Maybe you've lived enough years now where you can think, things haven't went as I wanted them to work. These were my ambitions as I brought them up. I had these plans and I sent them to Sunday school and I prayed over them and expected this and I encouraged them and this is the direction I set them. And that's the direction I set them, but that's the way they've went. But God is a God of grace. And God is a God who meets us in the midst of our sin and our failings and our shortcomings. God just doesn't leave us there to wallow in it. I want to point out something to you here tonight, something that I've missed before. Now, here, you're never going to invite me back, but I'll take my chances while I'm here. Time's moving, but I need to point this out. I've missed this previously. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 6, it says, now, if you're, if you're nodding off, the person beside you is nodding off, give them a dig in the ribs, because you don't want to miss this. I don't want to miss this. Then one of the seraphim flew to me. So these sinless angels, there's this bronze basin with a grill on it, having his hand a burning coal with which he had taken 
he had taken with tongs from the altar. So this angel goes to the altar, and it lifts a coal. This is right from the temple, a burning coal. Why was, it, why was there an altar in the temple? Well, whenever the sacrifice was made, and the animal had its throat slit, when the blood was shed, what did they do with the animal? They burnt it. And why did they burn it? Why did they not just bury it? Well, the fire was symbolic of the wrath of God. God's going to punish sin. He's going to judge sin. He's going to consume it. He's going to burn it up. And that's where we're told about this. That's where we're told about this fire and this altar. And this coal is taken from the place of God's wrath. Now notice that. This coal is taken from the place of God's wrath. And it touches Isaiah's lips. And what does he say? And he touched my mouth. The place where your sin has gathered. Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. And your sin is atoned for. Your sin is covered. Now let me just throw out a few of those words here and you can join the dots. We've got God's wrath and judgment and sin. We've got atonement for sin. A sacrifice has been made. And we've got a covering or a forgiveness of sin. And we're reading about this in Isaiah chapter 6. And sometimes I'm preaching and I say to myself, well, look, how do you get people to the cross of Christ? Where does Jesus come into it? I mean, you read this passage, you think, well, look, we've got God's wrath and sin. We've got sacrifice. We've got atonement. We've got forgiveness. That must really go to Jesus, right? You're with me in this, right? But as reading John chapter 12, verse 41, this is what John says. After quoting from Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Who's Isaiah talking about in Isaiah chapter 6? He's talking about Jesus. What's the only way that anybody anywhere has ever been right with God? Through saving faith in Jesus Christ. Did Isaiah know the gospel? According to John 12, he knew the gospel. Apparently he knew the gospel when he was writing Isaiah chapter 6. He wasn't just winging it. It wasn't just a few symbols and he thought, here's a few symbols and I don't know what these add up to. He knew that this was pointing forward to Jesus. That's why John says, Isaiah said these things because he saw his, who? Jesus' glory. The only way that anybody is ever going to be saved is saving faith in Jesus. The only way that anybody will ever have their sins forgiven is through saving faith in Jesus. Faith is that I grab hold of him and I say, I want you to forgive me. The only way that your son's ever going to be saved, the only way that your son is ever going to be right with God is through Jesus Christ. Whether you go to Botswana or Bangladesh, whether you're in Mozambique or you're in Macrofelt, the only way that anybody will ever be right with God is through Jesus. And what is Isaiah telling us here tonight? Isaiah is telling us the gospel because our God is a God of glory. Our God is a God of holiness and our God is a God of grace. What's the message for Northern Ireland on September the 11th, 2022? I am God and there are no others. And I'm on the throne. I'm sure my time's evaporated. I have one more point. Will you give me it? I'm taking it anyway. Here's the fourth thing. The fourth thing I want to just say in a moment. God is a God who is faithful. Our God is a God who is faithful, who always keeps his promises. Maybe you're here tonight and you're very discouraged about what's happened in your life. Or maybe you're praying and praying and praying and your prayers have not been answered. Our God is a God who's faithful to you. I don't know what's happening in Straight Congregational Church, and I don't know what's happening in your life. I, I, I don't think I've met any of you before. So I can say it with a liberty. I'm not getting at you. But God has been faithful to you. And he's been kind to you, and he's been good to you. And this passage, we've got Isaiah. This is not Isaiah, as it were, being saved, but this is Isaiah being recommissioned. And Isaiah is told, who's going to go? God asked the question, who's going to go for me? And it's a great missionary text. I'm sure a friend of Mozambique has heard it before. It's a great missionary text because the response is, here am I, send me. And Isaiah says, Look, I'll serve you, Lord. I'll give my life to follow you and, and do your will. But then it gets discouraging. 
because it's a great missionary text, and yet Isaiah says, I'll go, and God says, yes, you'll go for me, but what are you going to go and do? And God says, Isaiah, you're going to go, and you're going to be a light to people who are blind. You're going to be a trumpet and preach to people who are deaf. You're going to be a drum to people who take no notice of you. Isaiah, you're going to go and be a preacher for me, but Isaiah, you're going to be an unsuccessful preacher because you're going to go for your entire ministry and you're going to serve me and you're not going to see anything for it. But God didn't ask Isaiah to be successful. What did God ask Isaiah to do? To be faithful. And God said, I'll be faithful to you. God has a message for you here tonight, friends, and straight. He's a message for our country. He says, I am God and there are no others. And you're to turn from your sin and you're to trust in me. One who's glorious and holy and gracious and faithful. Let me ask you a question. Do you know him? Do you know him as your king? Do you know him as your Lord? He loves you. He wants to be in a close, intimate relationship with you. If you've backslidden, come back to him. You don't need to go through a man. You don't go through a church. You go through Jesus. He wants to hear from you. Maybe you haven't prayed in a long time. God wants to talk to you. Maybe there's sin in your life that you're, 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 you're just forgetting about. God wants to sort it out. He'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you. And he'll use you. Will you bow your head? Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us here tonight around your word. Father, the context of our nation speaks to us as we read this word acutely tonight. It comes with a sharpness that before I certainly have missed. And Lord, I thank you for all those that have gathered in tonight from the youngest to the oldest. And I pray that your word would be just that. It would be your word to them. For those that are here tonight, young or old, who are not yet saved, who have not yet come to Jesus and said, forgive me and cleanse me, I ask that they would do that tonight and they would do it without delay. Lord, for those of us that are seeking to live for you, please work in our lives so that we delight in you, so that we want to follow you, so that we want to give everything for your kingdom and for your glory with a white-hot passion. And we pray it in Jesus' name, our Savior's name. Amen. Well, we're drawing our time together to a, a close. Um, the way the service, the next part of it is going to work is we're going to stand and we're going to sing Abide With Me. Um, and then you're invited to join communion. As John said, if you're a believer, I'm going to say a few words before that. But if you want to remain in the service, please feel free. If you're not saved, don't feel uncomfortable. We're delighted that you're here. I can say that. We're really delighted that you're here. Just let the, the bread and the wine pass you by. No comment, no remark will ever be thought of. We're just so delighted you're here. But you can examine your own hearts. But we're going to stand and we're going to sing a great hymn that preaches to us as well. Abide with me.
please be seated. I'm going to invite your deacons, if they would uh, join me, just at the table. just going to read two passages of scripture real brief and, uh, and then I'm going to hand over to these gentlemen here. Uh, first of all from Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 36. Uh, this is Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again for the second time he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise let us be going, see my betrayer is at hand. Then I want to also read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is a passage which speaks about fencing the table. Coming to the Lord's table is not a light and momentary thing. It's weighty. This table, as John said at the start, is open to all those that know and love the Lord. If you're a believer, this, this table is open to you. If you're living in any known sin, confess your sin. If you're living your life and you're wandering far from the Lord, confess your sin. But listen to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup and after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Amen. Finishing there at the end of verse 29. Well, I just want to share a thought with you. And the thought that I want to share with you is this. The word is that your Lord wants an intimate relationship with you. God knows you. He knows all about you. Psalm 139 verse 16 says that before you had breathed one breath, before you had lived one day, every single day of your life was written down in his book. 
And God knows you, and he knows all about you, and he knows how many days you'll live, and he knows the exact moment when you will cease to breathe, when you will leave this scene of time. But what does God want? God wants an intimate, close relationship with you. He loves you, and he's gracious to you, and he's kind to you, and he calls to you. And he wants you, like in that garden of Gethsemane, he wants you to wait and to pray and to talk to him. Do you remember the disciples in that passage? Jesus is away, and he's in the garden, and they're coming up to the crucifixion. And we have heard the gospel tonight, and now we're going to see the gospel. What is communion? It's seeing the gospel. As you, by faith, take Jesus to be your Savior and King, so you, as it were, take his blood and his, and his body, and you remember him. But Jesus wants an intimate fellowship with you. So do you watch and do you pray? Do you talk to the Lord in prayer? Do you bring your life before him? I mean, I think of these disciples here, and they were hard-working fishermen. Sometimes people would say to me, they would say, Andrew, you know, being a minister is a really tough job. And I used to say, a tough job? If I was tailing prawns for them in the North Sea for two weeks, that would be a tough job. Fishermen are hardy sort. If I was bouncing up in a fishing boat, banging my head off the, the, the shaft and, and sand and tailing prawns, it would be difficult. And these fishermen were hard men. Hard workers, fishermen. Do you remember when Peter comes back to Jesus after, after being out fishing, what does he say? He said, we fished all night and we didn't catch anything. These were men that could work all night, but they couldn't pray for one hour. Well, what about you? Are you a hard worker? I'm sure you are. I'm sure you like to get into your work early and get at it and do a good job. And we can work hard. We can use our hands, and that's a good thing to do. But Jesus wants to speak to us about fellowship with him. We can work hard and we can play hard. But, but can we draw alongside Jesus? When we hear his call to, to fellowship, do we respond? I mean, we're told here that the disciples are tired. Jesus comes back to them and he says, your eyes are heavy and you're sleepy. And why is that? Are they just physically tired? Well, their physical tiredness is a symptom of their spiritual tiredness. Spiritually, they're sleepy. Spiritually, they haven't been watching. Spiritually, they haven't been praying. And so their physical tiredness is just really a symptom of their spiritual tiredness. So how are you tonight? How's your walk with the Lord? How's your fellowship with Him? He loves you. He really loves you. And he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross, to pay for you, for all your sins. But he wants an intimate relationship with you. And so he says, as you come around this table, talk to him. Confess your sin to him. Maybe say, Lord, I haven't been in the walk with you that I want to be, but Lord, Give me a desire. Give me the discipline. Give me the wisdom. Lord, the children I have are crazy. I never get a second. Lord, calm them for half an hour. Let me pray. Lord, the wife I have, she's always asked me to cut the grass. Lord, please help me. Get time alone with you because the Lord wants fellowship with you. He wants you to watch and pray and be in that close relationship. So maybe let's take a moment. Let's pray. Let's pray quietly. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads, to, to pray, and then I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to hand over to our, our, our deacons. So let's pray together. Our gracious God, we thank you that your son Jesus wants an intimate, close relationship with us, that we might be watchful and prayerful, that we might want to get alone with him and to lay our lives before him. Fathers, we examine ourselves. We see much sin in our lives, but we thank you that Jesus forgives sins. We thank you that Jesus, who forgives sins, welcomes us to this table. 
And so, Father, we ask that as we have heard your word and as we see your word, the gospel, and these elements, we ask that you might bless us and strengthen us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord Jesus, as we meet around your table tonight to remember you, we thank you if we've accepted you as our Savior that we can call you Savior and Lord. We thank you that we can say, where is death's sting? Where grave thy victory? And Lord, as we've been challenged tonight, we pray that you would help us to spend more time with you, you who love us, that we would get to know you better and we would remember you. We thank you for what you've done for us, Lord. And we thank you that in your name we can pray. Amen. Lord, we just thank you for who you are, Lord. Lord, we, we just um, sometimes forget how holy you are, Lord, and how awful our sin is, Lord, and we're sorry for that, Lord, and pray even this evening you just give us a greater appreciation of that, Lord, and that just reminds us just how truly amazing your grace is towards us, Lord. Lord, we just praise you so much for taking our sins, Lord, and taking the punishment that we deserve for our sins on the cross, Lord. And Lord, we just pray that you just help us to live lives that honor you, Lord, and just help us even in this coming week, Lord, just to even share our faith with others, Lord, and Lord, live lives that uh, glorify you in all we do, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for this time that we can gather together, Lord, and we just thank you that we can come and worship you this evening, in Jesus' name. Oh, we just pray, praise you for this, um, uh, this cup, this wine that reminds us of your blood that was shed for us, Lord, and we just praise you for that, in Jesus' name, amen.
Our gracious God, we thank you that we've been able to gather around your table tonight. We thank you, Father, for all your mercies to us. We thank you, Father, for that great day when we will be around your throne, when we will see thee as thy art and love thee with an unsinning heart. We ask, Father, that from this day until that day that we would be those who are on fire for you. who seek to love you and live for you and point others to you. Lord, as you've blessed us round your table, we ask that you would send us out as your people, that we might point others to you. In Jesus' name we cry. Amen. We're going to close our time by standing to sing, Here is Love. Or sorry, it's not. How deep the Father's love for us. How deep the Father's love for us. Let's stand and sing. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority both now and forevermore. Amen.